Now, it probably surprised you to find out there are many different approaches to the book of Revelations, but we're only going to deal with the two approaches that you are most likely to encounter. There's a lot of approaches that you're probably never going to encounter in your whole life. And these two approach, approaches differ primarily on the nature of what is called the millennial reign of Christ. Does Jesus reign as king on the earth or does he reign only as king over the earth? You basically have the premillennial view, which is Christ will return to earth in the future before a literal thousand year reign on earth. In this view, he's actually, one of the reasons he's coming back is to set up this kingdom on earth. And so premillennialists believe that most of the book of Revelation is future. Consequently, their view is called the futurist view. The other view that we're going to talk about is a millennial view. This view holds that Christ is presently reigning over the, over the earth, not on the earth, but over the earth, through the church and in heaven. And that the thousand years of Revelation 20 is just a metaphorical reference to the present church age which will culminate in Christ's return. All millennialists believe most of the book of Revelation is about things that happened in the past. Most of them hold to something called the preterist view. So the premillennialist sees the second coming of Christ as sort of the beginning, the premiere of the millennial kingdom. And the all-millennialist sees Christ's second coming as the finale of his kingdom over this earth. Now, most everybody who's listening to me right now has been taught the futurist view of the book of Revelation. You may have never even heard of the fact that anybody could hold any other kind of view besides the uh, futurist view. It's not easy for you to wrap your mind around. Some people believe that the, what happens in the book of Revelation, that's already happened. And that's why I wanted to begin this series with a review, an overview of the approach that you are least familiar with in regard to this book. Now, what I do not want is for you to be dismissive of this view just because you never heard of it. Because, for one thing, it was the dominant view throughout most of church history. Throughout most of church history, the church is held to an amillennial view, a preterist view of the book of Revelation. You just happen to be born in a period of history when the premillennial view is the most dominant. The all-millennialism view of the book of Revelation was, again, predominant for most of Christian history. Many churches of the Reformed tradition, Calvinist churches, Lutheran churches, even Roman Catholicism holds to some form of all-millennialism. The basic, the basic tenets of all-millennialism include the millennial kingdom is in existence now. That's the main difference with premillennialism. They think the millennial kingdom is right now. And it describes the time between Christ's first and second coming, particularly after Christ uh, being resurrected and ascended. Christ is ruling now from heaven as king on the throne of David over a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of believers. Remember, Pilate asked Jesus about his kingdom, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So that's, they take that to mean it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a kingdom of this world. And this spiritual kingdom is composed of people here that belong to the church on earth and then those that are saints in heaven. They do not believe there will be a future reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand years the promises made to Israel about land, about a nation, 
and a throne are either being fulfilled now in a spiritual way among believers in the church or God's material promises to the nation of Israel were conditional is how they view it. And Israel did not live up to those conditions due to disobedience. So God is under no obligation to fulfill any promises he made to them because they were conditional promises. They also believe that Satan is bound right now. The binding of Satan is described in Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3. They believe that's already occurred. And they obviously don't believe that it means that Satan is bound as to his person so that he's not permitted to roam about, as Peter talks about, seeking whom he may devour. They think he's only bound in one particular way, that he is bound with reference to he, he cannot stop the spread of the gospel. That is the only sense in which he is bound. The millennial kingdom was began after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. That is when he went to heaven. He's installed as king there. Jesus now rules over a spiritual kingdom from the throne of David in heaven or in our hearts and will later rule as king over the new heavens and the new earth. Satan has already been bound, but not as to his person, but rather as to a particular activity. He cannot prevent the spread of the gospel. That basically summarizes their view. Now, all millennialists have two basic approaches to the book of Revelation. The first view I've already told you about, or at least mentioned, is called preterism, which comes from the Latin word praetor, which means past. That means they think most of the book of Revelation, as I mentioned, happened in the past. They believe the book of Revelation is describing the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. A minority of all millennialists hold to another view called progressive parallelism. St. Augustine proposed the method of interpreting the book of Revelation using a series of recapitulations. According to this view, the book of Revelation consists of seven sections. You can divide the book of Revelation into seven sections. Each of those sections runs parallel to each other. Each section depicts the church and the world from the time of Christ's first coming to the time of his second coming. Sometimes the focus is more on the church. Sometimes the focus is more on what's happening in the world, but it's describing the same period of time. In other words, the book of Revelation describes the same period of time, the time between Christ's first and second comings in a slightly different way, seven different times. So let's talk about their preterism view. There are two types of preterists. There are partial preterists and there are full preterists. Most amillennialists are partial preterists. Partial preterism is the oldest of the two views. And it holds, as I just mentioned, that the prophecies mentioned in the book of Revelation were fulfilled in 70 AD when the Roman general Titus sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the Jewish temple, put a permanent stop to daily animal sacrifices. Most partial preterists also believe that when the Bible refers to the last days, whenever you see the phrase, the last days, it is not referring to the last days of humankind. It is not referring to the last days of the earth, that it is referring to the last days of the Mosaic Covenant. In other words, the last days only refer to the last days for the nation of Israel. And that came to fruition in, as I mentioned, AD 70. The Lord returned in judgment upon that nation at that particular time, but that was not the second coming. They do believe that the Lord is going to return in the future in a second coming. That's why they're only partial preterists. They think most of the book of Revelation is about the past, but the last two chapters are about the future. Revelation 1 through 20 are all about the past. Revelation 21 and 22 are about the future. That's when the new heavens and earth are in view. And then there is something that is not as widely held called full preterism. And full preterism is the belief that every single thing mentioned in the book of Revelation has already happened in AD 70. The second coming of Christ has already happened happen. The new heavens and the new earth have already been established. Now, most 
amillennialists, amillennialists even con consider a full preterism to be uh, heretical. So it's not a popular view. So in what sense could this be the new heavens and the new earth? Well, they view it sort of in the same way that we say a believer is a new creation in Christ. That after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, that everything became new. We believers became new, the heavens and the earth became new, and that is their understanding of the new heavens <coughs> and the new earth. Okay, so why do they believe that the events described in the book of Revelation are describing something that happened in the past? Probably the main verse that they use if you're in a discussion with a partial preterist, an amillennialist, their main verse would be <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 34. When Jesus said, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. So Jesus describes things in Matthew 24, which correlate with a lot of things in the book of Revelation. And he says those things will occur before this generation passes away. This generation, in their view, must refer to the generation of people that Jesus is talking to when he says this stuff. In other words, Jesus told his listeners, these things are going to happen while most of you are still alive. And to support this understanding of Jesus' use of the term this generation, they refer to other places in Matthew where Jesus uses this generation, exact same term, and it obviously refers to the generation to whom he is speaking. So in Matthew 11, verse 16, to what can I compare this generation? Same wording. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others, we played the flute for you and you did not dance, we sang a dirge and you did not mourn. And then in Matthew 12 and verse 41, it says the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom and now one greater than Solomon is here. And so they would ask us, who are premillennialists, by what leap of logic can the term this generation, as Jesus has used it previously in Matthew, suddenly refer to a future generation when you get to Matthew 24, verse 34, when in every other instance, it definitely is referring to the generation that Jesus is speaking to at that particular moment. They also believe that if all of this doesn't happen to that generation, that this would mean that Jesus uttered a false prophecy, which obviously means, uh, which could not happen. And so they believe, understanding this generation, as referring to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking, also easily dovetails with what John says at the beginning of the book of Revelation, when John says, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And in verse three, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. And so they say, look, Jesus said this would happen to this generation. John says, these things must soon take place because the time is near. And so it makes perfectly logical sense that Jesus was referring to that particular generation and that all these things happened in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, some critics of amillennialism and preterism in particular would say, yeah, but if you read Matthew 24, you also read all this, uh, you know, cosmic disturbance stuff that it talks about. And that did not happen at the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. For example, 
in Matthew 24 and verse 29. It says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so the critics of this view, the critics of preterism would say, hey, did his sign appear in the sky then? Did all the peoples of the earth see him coming on the clouds? And the answer of the partial preterist is simply to point out that this kind of language that is being used here in Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30, is simply judgment language, which we find in many different places of the Bible. And judgment language always speaks in hyperbole. It always speaks with exaggeration. It's not meant to be taken literally. And they would say we find this in other texts of the Bible. And so all this text is really saying is that the Lord is going to return in judgment upon the nation of Israel for her rejection and that all the peoples of the earth will see the judgment that he inflicts upon the nation of Israel. And where we find this language in other places is, for example, in Isaiah 13 and verse 13, an oracle concerning Babylon. This is a judgment against Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. See the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of the heavens and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Very similar to what Jesus says in Matthew 24. And then in Joel chapter 2 verse 10, before them, it talks about another judgment. The earth shakes, the sky trembles, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. So they would just say, this is just typical language that's used in the Bible to describe a judgment that is coming. And it does not need to be taken literally. And that's the sense in which Jesus meant it in Matthew 24. So, to summarize their view from what we've said, at least in this section, is this. Jesus said these things would happen to this generation. John said these things would soon take place, and the time is near. Judgment language is being used in the same way that it's been used in the Old Testament. Therefore, the book of Revelation describes the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple in A.D. 70. So that's why they, the primary reason they hold to the view that Book of Revelation talks about things that happened in the past. Now, the lesser known view of those two views is what's called progressive parallelism. And according to this view, the Book of Revelation consists of seven sections which run parallel to each other. Each one depicts the church and the world from the time of Christ's first coming until the time of his second coming, each section contains elements of opposition, then judgment, and ultimately victory in some form or fashion. And so the first of these seven sections is found in chapters 1 through 3. John sees the risen and glorified Christ walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. In obedience to Christ's command, John writes letters to each of the seven churches of Asia Minor, which represent the church age throughout time. The second of these sections is the vision of the seven seals found in chapters 4 through 7. John is caught up to heaven and sees God sitting on his radiant throne. He then sees the lamb that had been slain taking the scroll sealed with the seven seals, from the hand of the one sitting on the throne, the various seals are broken and various divine judgments on the, of the world are described. The third section found in chapters 8 through 11 describes the seven trumpets of judgment, which in this view are simply another seven ways of describing that period of time between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. The fourth section deal is chapters 12 through 14. It deals with the vision of a woman giving birth to a son while there's a dragon that waits to devour 
the son as soon as he is born. It's an obvious reference to the birth of Christ. The rest of the section describes the continued opposition of the dragon to the church through various means. The fifth section is chapters 15 through 16. It describes the seven bowls of wrath, which are simply a variation of the seven seals and the seven trumpets. The sixth section, chapter 17 to 19, describes the fall of Babylon and the beast who oppose God. Babylon just simply stands for worldliness, the forces of secularism, godlessness, and opposition to the kingdom of God. And the final section, chapters 20 to 22, narrates the doom of the dragon, thus completing the overthrow of the enemies of Christ, describes the final judgment, the final triumph in Christ and his church in the renewed universe called the new heavens and the new earth. Now, most of you were probably not taught that. You were taught that the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls are telescopic, not just repeating the same period of time, describing it in different ways. In other words, you were taught this probably. The seven trumpets occur and are, are part of the seventh seal. The seventh seal is broken and that starts the seven trumpets. And then when you get to the seventh trumpet, that starts the seven bowls of wrath. But the seven bowls of wrath and the seven trumpets are all part of the seventh seal. This view believes that all of this is describing basically the same period of time in different ways, giving us different facts about what is occurring between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And so you have the seven seals, talks about the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale green horse. The fifth seal has the martyrs. The sixth seal has cosmic disturbances. The seventh seal starts the seven trumpets or silence in heaven for half an hour. That section ends, the seven seals ends with this statement. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then you have the seven trumpets. And it's describing in this view the same period of time, just giving us different information. They, they believe this stuff is mostly symbolic, referring to different things. They don't take it literally. Uh, a third of the trees, vegetation, and land are burned up by some kind of firestorm. Is the first trumpet, the second trumpet, a third of the sea turns to blood, a third of the sea creatures die, a third of the ships destroyed by something thrown into the sea. The third trumpet, a third of the fresh water becomes undrinkable because of something called wormwood. Fourth trumpet, the light, the moon, and the stars are dimmed by a third. Then you have the fifth trumpet, which is also called the first woe. And demons are released from the abyss to torment men for five months. They cannot harm the 144,000. Then you have the sixth trumpet, which is the second woe. This four super demons are released along with a 200 million demonic army. And they kill a third of mankind. And then you have the seventh trumpet, which is also called the third woe. Loud voices in heaven which sing the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. That sounds like a, fin a finale, doesn't it? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. That section also ends with the statement, there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and this time it adds a severe hailstorm. And then you have the seven bowls. And the first bowl poured out upon the land results in painful sores. Second bowl, everything in the sea dies. Third bowl, all fresh water is made undrinkable. Fourth bowl, intense heat of the sun. Fifth bowl, darkness. Sixth bowl, Euphrates rivers dries up to make way for the battle of Armageddon. And then the seventh bowl kind of concludes everything. And guess what? That section also ends with a statement. There came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. So, to summarize this section, according to this view, the church is the subject of each of the seven recapitulations, and the entire history of the church age is being surveyed in different ways with each of these cycles. 
they understand most of those symbols to be symbolic of not literal things. Each re recapitulation with reference to the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, each of them ends with some form of thunder, lightning, and an earthquake, which in their view reinforces the idea that they're talking about the same thing, they're concluding the same way, so it's talking about the same period of time. And they believe the world simply goes on with good and evil both at work until Christ returns and takes us to heaven. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but what about Israel in this view? Well, <laughs> they don't think Israel has a role in the future. When asked about the promises of God to national Israel, the promises God made to Abraham, the promises God made to David, all millennialists will typically, an typically answer in one of three ways. They'll either insist that all of these promises are being fulfilled in the church by our connection to Christ, or they'll say the promises were conditional and that Israel did not keep the conditions and therefore God is not obligated to keep those promises. Or some of them will argue all of those promises, at least the land promises and stuff to Israel were fulfilled either under Joshua or under Solomon. And so why do they think the promises of Abraham, made to Abraham and David, are, can be said to be fulfilled spiritually? Well, they take Galatians 3.16 where Paul says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, singular. The scripture does not say and to seeds, plural, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person who is Christ. So they understand that to say that all those promises were actually made to Christ. And then in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. They are all fulfilled in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So all millennialists do not believe there is a distinction between Israel and the church. Sometimes they are accused of something called replacement theology. They don't like that term. They would say they don't think the church replaces Israel. Rather, it's more correct to say that they believe that the church is a continuation of Israel. That these two groups, Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, are connected and were connected through Christ. Israel is simply a way to referring to the assembled people of God in the Old Testament, and the church is simply a way to refer to the assembled people of God in the New Testament. They say that in Romans 9, Paul makes it clear that not everybody who is ethnically connected to the nation of Israel is a true Israelite. For in Romans 9, 6, Paul says it is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. So they take that to mean some who did not descend from Israel are Israel. And then Paul referred to the churches in Galatia as the Israel of God, according to this view. In Galatians 6, 16, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of of God. He was writing to the churches of Galatia. In their view, he just called them the Israel of God. Consequently, they would hold to this belief that we could call ourselves spiritual Jews. Now, the way that they get to that place is they use a certain hermeneutic, a system of interpretation, and they have different premises that they base this hermeneutic on. And so here are Here's the amillennial hermeneutic, at least insofar as it refers to this stuff. The first premise is that Israel, the nation, in the Old Testament, was meant to bring into the world the true Israel. That that's why they existed in the first place. Israel as a nation was there to bring into existence the true Israel, which is Jesus. That's the second premise. Jesus is true Israel. 
And indeed, he is called true Israel in Isaiah 49. And then premise number three, that is as true Israel, Jesus fulfills all the promises made to Israel, either through Adam or through David, that Jesus fulfills them all, just as we just read about in 2 Corinthians 1.20, and uh, we read about in those other verses. And then the fourth premise is all who are connected to true Israel are also connected to those promises made to true Israel. So they're promises made to us. And so they were really always meant to be understood as spiritual promises. So all connected to true Israel are also Israel. And their conclusion is there are no future material promises to or for the nation of Israel waiting to be fulfilled in the plan of God because they have already been fulfilled in Christ. So in this view... There is no rapture. There is no tribulation. Uh, at Either before the tribulation or at some point during the tribulation. Because there is no tribulation, that stuff has already occurred. We're just waiting for the Lord to return for his second coming. And that is what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians 4 when he says we meet the Lord in the air, we go in the air, we meet the Lord, and then we come back to earth and there's judgment of unbelievers uh, that occurs and then Jesus simply uh, installs the new heavens and the new earth, destroys the old heavens and the old earth. And that all the book of Revelation is really doing is simply assuring us of Christ's ultimate victory by describing this past victory that Christ has gained over the nation of Israel and the forces that were aligned against him. All right. That should be enough to confuse you for one night. Uh, do you have any questions? Now, bear in mind, I am not going to rebut this view tonight. That's not my purpose. My purpose is simply to make you aware of this view. So do you have any questions about the view that you found confusing that you might like further clarification on? I just want you to see, hopefully you will at least admit, their view has a certain logic to it, whether you accept the hermeneutic they use to get there or not. It's, it has a certain logic to it. So I don't want you to just be dismissive of the view because you never heard it before or treat people who hold this view like, well, that's dumb. Why do you believe that? Um, how I view the book of Revelation will actually become, I've already told you I'm premillennial. I believe in the futurist view. Uh, we'll get into that when I actually get into the book of Revelation, which, good news, I don't think is as complicated as, I think people make it very complicated. I really don't think it is that uh, complicated. Does anybody have a question about the amillennial view, the preterist view, the progressive parallelism view, any clarification that you need? Yes, Chris. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What did they say, what now? Just at the end, when, when there's this final judgment and final triumph of Christ, at the end, uh, you know, they think that the premillennialist view of a necess necessity of a material kingdom here on this earth, they kind of think that's like unspiritual. Why would you want this earthly thing when you, you know, this spiritual kingdom is better than this earthly kingdom? So why are you guys so hung up on this earthly kingdom? Spiritual is better than earthly. So, you know, and, and so they, they take most of that stuff, obviously, in a spiritual sense. And at the end, Satan is obviously banished and, and punished and, um, you know, so they do believe in that. They don't think he just continues to go about doing what he wants. Anybody else?
We're good? You find it confusing? You find it hard to understand? <laughs> well, it's, it's hard. You know, if, that, if that's your first time to hear of that view, I'm sure it really kind of throws you for a loop. Because... We've all been trained to think of the, of the book of Revelation as all being in the future. So to come across people who think, no, that's, it's all about the past. It's like, huh? What? It's, it's, it's hard to even wrap your mind around it, as I, as I mentioned when we first started. Okay, well, if that's it, then I will close this in prayer and we'll be done with this section. Next time, I'll give an overview of the premillennial view. And then the time after that, we'll actually break into the book of uh, Revelation. Lord, we th thank you for this time gathered here to study your word. Pray your blessings upon each and every person listening and who came tonight. And uh, Lord, we look forward to learning more about uh, this great book that you have given to your church. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.